All right, here we are. Lesson number four on lighting and color. Thank everybody for showing up and everybody who's watching at home. Um, let you know right now that if you have questions, you can certainly uh, send them to me via email. It's photoclass at maxoutput.com or use the little form you see down there at the bottom of the page and just type in the question and it'll show up here on my computer. So, okay, we're going to go ahead and get started this week with another quiz. I actually warned you about it this time. So, turn on the projector so you guys can see. Try to turn on, okay, there we go. Maybe. Okay, question number one. All right. My point-and-shoot camera doesn't have a setting to control the aperture. What can I do to blur the background behind my subject? Okay. Remember, we can have more than one answer. So, answer A, turn on my flash. Answer B, use the landscape setting. C, use the portrait setting. And D, select a lower or faster ISO. Anybody have any opinions? Uh, Anthony, your hand was first. C, yeah, first thought. Okay, portrait setting. Okay, that's definitely a valid answer. Anybody else have any other opinions? No? Okay. Now let's see what we got. Okay, with, uh, with this particular uh, issue, with trying to blur the background, we can either use the portrait setting on a little point-and-shoot camera or even a full-size camera. And the other option is to use a lower or faster ISO. That will, in turn, cause the aperture to have to open up, which means blurring in the background. You need more light. So, okay. And I left A as a potential answer because depending on how the camera handles the additional light that's created by the flash, you might actually be able to get the same, same sort of effect. So, depends on the camera. What's that? When's the answer A? Okay. Questions? Okay. All right. So... Next question. All the pictures I take outside are very blue. What is wrong? Answer A. Turn off the flash. Answer B. Select a higher ISO. C. Change the white balance setting to auto or daylight. Or D. Your camera is depressed. <laughs> Give it some Prozac. <laughs> hey, Jonathan. So my initial thought would be D, of course. Yes, <laughs> um, as would everybody's. Especially being in Utah, it's common, I guess. But C is probably your best bet because your coloring is off, and so if you adjust the white balance, then your camera will know what white is and what gray is, and it will adjust everything else accordingly. Very good. Not only did you answer the question correctly, you also explained it correctly as well. So, <laughs> okay. So C is the only correct answer on this question. Okay, all right, moving on to question number three. What does the landscape setting on my camera do? Answer A, turn off the flash. Answer B, select a large aperture. C, select a small aperture. D, increase picture sharpness. Any ideas here? Anthony. All but B. All but B. Okay, any other opinions? Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, you could always turn the flash back on or something, but, yeah, all but B is typical. Okay. All right. Correct answer, the most correct answer here is answer C. Select a small <laughs> aperture. And then A and D are both sometimes, you know, depending on the camera. Some of them, it turns off the flash on landscape setting, and some it increases the picture sharpness. So that really depends on the camera. Some will do those, some will not, so... There you go. Okay, questions, comments? All right, moving on. Okay, what is white balance? Answer A, making sure that there is enough white in my pictures. Answer B, adjusting exposure to compensate for lighting color. Answer C, adjusting the camera for the color of lighting. Answer D, a game with crayons and a scale. <laughs> Any thoughts here? We're getting a couple chuckles. <laughs> Anybody have any idea? Okay, Anthony's saying C. Anybody else? 
Okay, yeah, C is the correct answer here. Setting a white balance on the camera is used to make sure that the camera knows what color your lighting is. Okay? All right. Next question. What is a histogram? <laughs> we didn't actually talk about this during class, but those who stayed after got a pretty good lecture about this. Okay? Answer A, a, pr a procedure performed by my doctor. <laughs> B, an essential element of my multivitamin. Answer C, a graph showing the color distribution in my pictures. And answer D, a graph showing the lighting distribution in my pictures. Anybody? D. I heard a D. Anybody else? Yeah, D is the correct answer there. It's a graph showing the lighting distribution. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll actually talk about that on camera next week when we start into Photoshop. Okay. And question six. The word slower when applied to photography means A, a lens with a smaller aperture, B, a shutter speed with a lower number, C, an ISO with a lower number, or D, a photographer who isn't very bright. D. D? <laughs> okay, think about this. Jonathan? Well, you talked about how a big lens is typically something you call a fast lens. Mm -hmm. And so that would mean you do the opposite, so a smaller aperture for one. Smaller, when I say smaller, I mean physically oh, smaller, not a smaller number. That's what I meant. Okay. Physically smaller. Okay. Because the big lens has right. a big aperture. Right. Mm -hmm. So that would be a slower, mm -hmm. quote unquote. Okay. And technically a, an ISO with a lower number could mm -hmm. be the same. Yep. Okay. So we got A and C. Anybody have any other opinions? Okay. It's actually A, B, and C. Uh, like, like Jonathan mentioned, a lens with a small aperture is a slow lens. A slow shutter speed, it's a lower number. I'm, I sorry, I actually take that back. I wrote that wrong. So scratch, scratch B. B's not right. I, I rephrased it at the last minute. And C and ISO with a lower number. So, yeah, it's A and C here. Just ignore the B. Okay, and one last question. A gray card can be used to get the proper exposure. Should not be used to white balance a camera. Is an inexpensive tool that every photographer should have. And is a poor substitute for a placemat at a dinner table. <laughs> no, any, any, uh, C, dog, it's C. C. And? And, 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 and A. Okay. And maybe D. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> So A, C, and D. <laughs> I don't recommend using your gray card at the dinner table. You want to keep it clean. So, Okay, so that's the end of the quiz. How did everybody do? All right. Okay. All right. So let's just jump jump right into color here. Um, I was going to spend an entire lesson on this, but I didn't want to bore you that long. Okay. So color is something that is perceived when certain wavelengths of light are reflected off of an object. Okay. Does that make sense? We talk about how a red object is actually just reflecting red light, and all the other colors are being absorbed. So that's what's going on with color now. Any colors visible in an object must be present in the light source that illuminates it. So in other words, if you have a red object and it's under a green light, it's not going to look red at all. It's going to look basically black because there is no red in the green light. Okay, follow? Make sense? Okay, now this one is really important. Our eyes and our brains work together to determine color and you kind of assume that it's mostly our eyes doing the work with color, but really it's mostly our brain. And I'll, I'm going to do a demonstration here in a minute to demonstrate just how much your brain has to do with the perception of color. So um, it's a psychological thing, mostly. I mean, their eyes are there to record it, but it's mostly a psychological thing. Okay? And some combinations of colors are more pleasing than others. So if you have uh, complementary colors that might look better together than, say, a uh, rusty orange and puke green, you know, wood together. So um, keep that in mind. 
And then the last one, this is kind of goes along with the third point here, and a perception of color is relative. Okay, let me, let me actually <laughs> demonstrate. Okay, I'm looking at this picture here. Do the red squares on the right half or the left half look brighter? Left, right. left. 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 left half. Wait, which looks brighter? Right there, which looks brighter? Which, yeah, which of the... The ones on the right? Right looks lighter. Yeah, lighter, brighter. The correct answer is that they're both exactly the same. And your brain is playing tricks on you because of the colors that are surrounding. So you've got the, uh, on the left, the red in the same bar as the yellow, surrounded by the blue. It actually makes it look darker than the red that's on the right. Okay? All right, same thing here. It's uh, more obvious on video than it is on the projector, but the green on the right looks considerably brighter. The green looks considerably brighter on the right than it does on the left. And it's completely a mind thing. It's your brain telling you that it's that way, even though it's really not. Talk to me after. <laughs> okay, and here's another one. Uh, the yellow squares uh, are actually all exactly the same color and brightness here, but especially in the white square, the yellow looks darker than it does in some of the other ones. So our brains definitely play, play tricks on us, and our perception of a given color is based on what surrounds it. So keep that in mind when you're taking pictures. If you want something to really stand out, if you want a color to really stand out, then place it opposite, or place it next to opposite colors or complementary colors, okay? This next one's kind of fun. Okay, everybody stare at this one for, we'll say, about 30 seconds, and then I'm going to do something here in a minute that's going to blow your mind a little bit. Start the black dot, yeah. Stare right at the center of the picture of the black dot. It's kind of funny to watch everybody look in different directions here. Okay. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and go to another picture. You wow. see it? Do you see what happened? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. The picture is actually black and white. But after you stare at this one for a while, and then go to the black and white image, your brain sees color for, oh. for a split <laughs> second. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So there you go. There's there's another demonstration that our brains are really there. Uh, what's interpreting color? So it's a psychological effect, more than more than a physical thing. Okay. All right. Let's see. I'm gonna move on to primary colors. Okay. What are the primary colors? <laughs> what, is, what, were, what were we taught in school? What are the primary colors? Red, yellow, blue. Red, yellow, blue. That's right. Okay. Well, unfortunately, that's not actually the correct answer. There's two different sets of primary colors. And when you're talking about pigments, like what you're doing with crayons, ink, that kind of thing, they're actually magenta, cyan, and yellow. Okay. So if you look at a newspaper and you look at the individual colors that they use, or like printing on a cereal box or something like that, they always use magenta, cyan, and yellow in order to make up all the different colors. And I'll show you why here in a second, but the primary colors for light are different. They're red, green, and blue. RGB, RGB yeah. So if you're familiar with computer monitors and how they process RGB signals, it's actually, those are your primary colors for light, okay? All right. Um, mixing of colors of light is an additive process, whereas um, when you're dealing with pigments, that's a subtractive process. So like for example, if you have a piece of paper and you color it all red, and then you color green on top of it, you're subtracting the amount of white that comes back at you, which end up as a kind of a brown mess, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, whereas with light, that's not true. Light, when you add two different colors, you end up with something that's brighter and is a different color. So, let's see. Let's, uh, did I lose my images? I may have. Oh, let me go ahead and... Uh, 
I'll have to go ahead and find these. Alright. Okay. So here are your subtractive colors, your primary colors for pigments. When you overlay colors on top of one another, you end up with something that shows less light instead of more. And then like, you combine all three of the primary colors and you get a gray or a black, depending on how uh, pure your colors are. So there's your uh, kind of yellow and blue mate, green and yeah. So, but you can see here that the yellow when combined with magenta gives you red and yellow combined with cyan actually gives you green. So that's why when they tell you that the primary colors are red, yellow, and blue, it's actually not right. <laughs> they're just keeping it simple. Instead of saying cyan, magenta, and yellow, they're just saying red, yellow, and blue. But they're actually cyan, magenta, and yellow. Okay, and then with light, it's an additive process. So you combine red light with blue light, you get kind of a magenta color. Blue light with green light, you get a teal or cyan color. And then red and yellow, I'm sorry, red and green make yellow. You combine all three, and that's when you actually get white. Okay? That makes sense? Everybody follow? I know that's a little bit uh, different than what you've probably been told in the past, but uh, it's the way things really work. There's a whole science behind, behind color. All right, so we are going to play with a color wheel here for a minute. And the color wheel is a tool that's used to help us find pleasing combinations of color. And this is where we really apply the principles of color to photography. So when we're taking pictures, we want to try and find uh, objects that are in these color schemes, or a color scheme that would be found on the color wheel. So, let's see. Uh, blank the screen and then pull up this nifty little color wheel program I've got. So the first uh, color scheme that we're going to talk about here is called analogous. And uh, what this means is that we're going to do colors that are similar to our primary color. So we'll have, we've got our little dot here that we can move around, choose the primary color that we want to play with. And then by slide, adjusting the slider, we can find other colors that are analogous to that color. And what we end up with is pleasing schemes. So what's going on here is three colors that are equidistant on the color wheel. Okay, make sense? All right, so then we go into complementary colors, and these are opposites. So we've got like a, a, a blue and a yellow here. Those are opposites on the color wheel, and those look nice together. They provide really good contrast. We can move it around and find any on the opposite of any color. Okay, so then we'll go to something called the split complement which is where we are we're on the opposite side of the color wheel in varying, varying degrees. So, for the most part, these colors look nice together, don't they? Okay. Let's go through a couple more here. Double complement. This is uh, two colors that are complementary, or two pairs of colors that are complementary. Okay, alternate complement, you can vary the width, Oops. you get different color cubes here. Yeah, these colors would also not only be good for photography, but they'd also work really well for interior design or if you're doing scrapbooking pages, that kind of thing. So basically anytime you need to combine multiple colors, using the color wheel is a good way to come up with schemes that work well. And this is triadic, this is where you have three that are that form an equilateral triangle on the color wheel. And the last one is tetradic, which we have four colors that are that form a uh, square. Okay. Okay. Alright, so name some situations when we might have some control over color in our pictures. We might have, what? have control over color in our pictures. What kind of pictures that we take where what, what do we have control over the color that's being in the shot? Yes, Jonathan? Maybe like a family portrait, you can decide what everyone's wearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay. That's good. That's definitely good. Anthony? Maybe if you have a studio and you have different backdrops or maybe a colored light and you're trying to really see. Yeah, that's definitely a good example. If a, a person walks in, they want a, port want a portrait taken, they're wearing red, you can find 
a color that's going to work well with the red that they're, they're wearing. Yeah, definitely. Okay? Any other situations come to mind? Maybe choosing your background? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, choosing background colors and whatnot. Um, what, if, what if, for example, you're, somebody asked you to take engagement pictures and they want to do it outside? You could come up with a color scheme to help them stand out from the trees or whatever. So keep that sort of thing in mind. So anybody wants a copy of this program, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be putting it up on the website. That's awesome. So. Does this program come on a Mac? <laughs> no, sorry, no Mac version. <laughs> did you create that? I did write the software, yes. Okay. All right, so any other comments on color? I know we kind of breezed through that. But, uh, Do you have any good picture examples? I, you know what? I don't have anything picked out. Sorry. <laughs> I could probably find something if you want to wait. Oh, well, afterwards, maybe. Yeah. You could, you could do your color hues, but you could choose a certain type of white balance mm -hmm. to also go with the, what they're wearing or the, the backdrop. You know, like a sunset, gold tones, you know, could also match what they're wearing. Mm -hmm. Or if you wanted it to be more blue to match what they're wearing, you could choose a blue or white balance. Right. Right, definitely. Uh, in, fact, in fact, white balance is actually the next thing that we are going to be talking about. And we covered it briefly last week, but I uh, wanted to go into a little bit more detail with white balance this week. Okay? So white balance is the setting on the camera uh, for the correct color of your lighting. We talked about how incandescent lights we have, say, for example, here in this room, are definitely more orange than the sunlight. And... Uh, other situations, you know, fluorescent lighting has kind of a green light and so forth. And you have to, with white balance setting on your camera, you can make sure that your pictures are coming out to the right color. Because having the wrong white balance will ruin the color in your pictures. Say, for example, if your white balance is set to blue and you take a picture of a yellow object, blue and yellow are on the opposite sides of the color wheel, um, anything that's yellow is going to come out looking white. So you lose your color completely by having the, right, the wrong white balance setting there. So, and then vice versa. If your white balance is too orange and taking a picture of a blue object, it's going to look too white. So, white balance can ruin your colors if it's not set properly. It can make your skin look sick. And it can definitely make you look sick, yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to show a sample picture in here in a minute with the white balance is wrong. Uh, having the wrong white balance affects the mood of the photographs. We talked about how color can affect mood. For example, if a picture is too blue, it's going to seem a little more dull and depressing than something that's a little bit warmer. And have more of a warm tone to it. Okay. And along with this, when you're taking pictures and you have control of lighting, you try not to mix lighting of different colors in the same at the same time. For example, you don't want to be using indoor incandescent lighting while you have sunlight coming through a window if you can avoid it, because they're different colors and it'll definitely show up in your pictures. So even an auto setting won't take care of that on your camera, and you'll probably just end up with a mess. So unless you're trying something artsy. Unless you're trying something artsy and you deliberately know what's going on and you want to control it, you know. Like I've mentioned before, all the rules can be broken for artistic reasons, but if you're trying to go with something that's absolutely accurate to what you're taking a picture of, then you've got to make sure that your white balance setting is, is dead on. So Okay. All right. Here, uh, kind of unclear on the projector, but this is the scale of the different colors of lighting that are on the white balance scale. All the way down at the left, you've got 1800 Kelvin. It's measured in Kelvin, and whole scientific reason for that, I won't get into it, but uh, measured in Kelvin, from, this goes from 1800 to 16,000. And uh, for example, in the light that we're under here is about 3200 Kelvin, so it's going to be a little bit left to the 4000 mark there. And uh, sunlight is typically around 6,000, 5,500, 6,500, somewhere in that range, depending on time of day. And then uh, televisions, for example, are typically up in the uh, 9,000 Kelvin range. So televisions will put out a very blue light compared to the sunlight. So when you're setting your white balance, you've got to make sure that you've got it set right. Otherwise, you're going to end up with something that looks like this way too blue. Uh, I had to deliberately adjust this one, but uh, 
<laughs> you can see what happens here. This, this one's way too blue. Uh, and then this one is way too orange. Mm -hmm. So you can see how, how it affects. What, what, what do you think of when you see this picture? What does it make you feel? Stormy, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it feels like it's cold. stormy outside. Chilly, cold. Yeah, chilly, cold. It feels like a winter shot. You know, that kind of thing. This one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Too much, too much tanning cream. <laughs> Something like that. Okay. So if you get the white balance set right, you get it with a much better picture. So there's white balance. Okay. All right. We've got to move. We've got a lot to cover. Okay. Um, first lesson. I s what did I say was everything in photography? Anybody remember? Control of lighting is everything in photography. So that's what we're going to focus the rest of tonight's lesson on, is controlling lighting to get the best images, get the best pictures. Okay? All right, so let's talk about different light sources that we have to deal with. We're going to first talk about sor light sources that already exist that are probably not under our control. And some of those primary sources are sunlight, overhead lights, and lamps. Those are three of the primary ones you've got to deal with. Okay? And then there are some secondary sources of light you might not think about. But for example, fires, they definitely put off light. It's very orange. Televisions and computer monitors. And then another secondary source of light is any reflections of light that comes from the primary sources. Okay? So. Anytime there's a light on in a room, there's always light bouncing around off of everything, and that actually affects the way your, your pictures look. Uh, if you've got light bouncing off of an orange object, anything that's near that object is going to have an orange tint to it. And so you really got to be careful of that kind of thing. And uh, make sure that you're not coloring things in a way that you don't want to. Of course, you can always use that artistically. If you want something to appear more orange, put something orange next to it, and uh, that will make it, will make, make it take on that tint. <laughs> the moon, <laughs> that's a good question. I've never actually thought about that. It's bounced off the sun, but uh, it definitely has a color of its own. So, so. good question. It seems blue, doesn't it? It could be blue, yeah. I've never, I don't think I've taken any. Look at the moon, that should be about the colors. That's, that's the answer to color blind. Oh, no, blue. Blue. <laughs> 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 Do you have an answer, Dave? I don't. I since you asked her a question. I mean, it, it seems blue when you go outside, but uh, it could be just a straight, low-key light. Yeah. White. I was thinking maybe a white. Yeah. Sometimes yeah, I would guess it's some. It's a, a variation of. Yeah, it's a variation of a white. Frost. Frost. Yeah. We don't know. I don't know. <laughs> maybe we'll have to measure that later. Take the camera outside and get a measure out. There's a high-end cameras like this, you can actually find a color measurement off of things like that. So. Good question. Don't know. Okay. All right. Make sure. Okay. And these are light sources that we have control over as photographers. The primary one, of course, being the camera flash. Uh, we have a lot of control over what we can do with the camera flash. Even on the little point and shoots, we've got some different flash settings that we can use, or we can adjust the flash level. So we can adjust the flash. And then another thing that we can use are if I can reach this, reflectors. So here is photography reflector. This one's got kind of a gold tint to it to make people look warmer, more pleasing. And then the other side is just white for having, having adding a little bit of fill under people's eye sockets and noses and so forth. So reflector is one of the best tools that a photographer can have. And fortunately, they work with all types of cameras. So we'll, we'll talk a little more, a little more detail there. And then the last one we'll talk about briefly is a diffuser. This one's a diffuser. Can you see the difference? It lets light pass through it instead of blocking it and reflecting it. I mean, you can sort of use it as a reflector too, but it's primarily designed to diffuse light and give it kind of a, a softer edge. So, okay. All right. Okay, so with with flashes, we have a few different things that we can do. 
we have the built-in flash on cameras. It's going to take me a minute to bring this up. Okay, there's the built-in flash. Uh, let me get a shot of that, Brad. Okay, the built-in flash on the camera. Okay, and point-and-shoot cameras have them too. There's, there's the flash on that one. Okay, that's one flash option we've got. Okay. Okay, and then the next thing we have is the flash attachment. So this goes on top of the camera. Okay, the flash attachment. And surprisingly enough, this one actually works on this camera too. So sometimes point and shoot cameras you can actually put an external flash on. So it's my Canon PowerShot G1 I've had for years. Yeah. So sometimes even when you have a point and shoot, you can use the external flash. What flash that, uh, that one right there? This flash? That camera. PowerShot G1. Oh, this one? Oh, it's a Canon uh, 40D. That's my newest toy. I bought that a couple days ago. Uh, I thought it looked new. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we've got the flash attachment. Okay. And then along with the flash attachment, I'll show you a nifty little trick here. And this is what we call the bounce flash. So we'll go ahead and put this on the camera. And get a shot. Brad, do your job. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so the bounce flash is when you take, if you take a camera flash and point it up at a ceiling or off of a wall. Essentially what you're doing is you're trying to change the, where the light is coming from. So you bounce it off of a ceiling, and it's a, it's a more natural look than the deer-in-the-headlights flashlight look that you get when you go straight on. So that's bounce flash. And we're, we're going to demonstrate all these things here in a minute. Get some hands-on. Okay? Next thing that we can talk about is the fill flash. And basically what the fill flash does is kind of like the white reflector that I mentioned a minute ago. It helps to fill in some of the holes that are some of the shadows that are caused under, like in people's eye sockets, under their nose, under their chins, whatever. Uh, the fill flash is just there to kind of accentuate the light that's already there. So you use that even in sunlight. When I'm doing wedding photography, I always use a flash outdoors, indoors, whatever, just to help them make, make people look a little bit nicer. So that's the fill flash. And then the last one we got here is off-camera flash. And those of you that are here, you can see that I've got a flash set up on a stand over here. And uh, we'll use that here in a second. And that's actually remotely controlled from my camera by putting a transmitter on it. So by doing that, you can totally remove the light source from the camera itself. So, Okay, do we have anybody who wants to volunteer to be a model for a couple of quick pictures? Nobody volunteers. We're going to do any, meeny, miny, mo. I'll do it. Okay, come on. All right. Let's step up here, the white line. Just don't make me look bad. <laughs> well, we're going to do a couple different things. What are you Toes on the white line facing us. Yeah, we're going to turn the projector off, so. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Okay, so. Turn on the camera here. And you guys will see what I'm doing here in a minute. Okay. Yeah, if you want. Okay, so okay, you can sit down for just one minute. We're gonna come, we'll come back to you though. All right, so I'll plug in the camera here. Okay, there we go, and unmute, and there we go. What happened here? Yeah. That's what we call <laughs> that's what we call harsh lighting. Harsh edges. Not very flattering, is it? Mm. Not at all. Okay? Alright, so it's kind of art kind of artistic, but that, I wouldn't exactly call that a good photograph. <laughs> okay? Alright, so I'll meet again. McCoy, you can step back up there. We're gonna do something a little bit different. Brent? Hold this like halfway between Kalena and the flash. 
Stand up. <laughs> yeah, we want, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is going to be diffused a little bit. Okay. All right. Oh, we got a blink, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ignore the flashing there. That's just telling me that part of the picture is overexposed. But what we got here is it's a much softer lighting. It's still not very flattering. So we have kind of a harsher here and a little bit less harsh here. Okay? All right, now let's try something a little bit different. We're going to bounce the flash off the ceiling. Okay, this should be... Okay, what do we got? Is that the... Is that the one? Have you seen it? Got it here, Brad. You're not getting it there. Okay. All right. So. It's a little bit better. Yeah. yeah. The light source is definitely coming from a little bit higher up, which is a little more natural. Most natural lighting comes from above. Mm. So. A little bit better. We've got three different variations here. So. Now let's do one more thing here. We're gonna put the cat, put the flash back down. Okay, all right, now, Brent, you want to come over here? You get to be reflector reflector, reflector boy. Okay, so here, we're going to be reflecting, you got it pointed right? Okay, we're reflecting the light, both, we'll get the light for primary light source, from, light, for, light source from the right, and a little bit of reflection from the left. Okay, so, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, so they're starting to see a little bit more over here. So. Maybe try one with the reflector right here in our face. Now yeah, let's try another one with the reflector right up against and see what we get. Okay, yeah. Okay, this is going to be a little bit better, I think. Okay. There we go. So. Without having to add another light source, we've significantly improved this picture. <laughs> okay, so there we've kind of got a little bit of uh, what you can do with a flash and how a reflector helps, and the diffuser as well. So, questions, comments, anything? Okay, all right, so let's go back to our slideshow. Okay, so with reflectors, we have got the collapsible reflectors like I showed you a minute ago. You can buy at photography stores. Unfortunately, they're kind of expensive. Fortunately, uh, light naturally bounces off of anything, and that means that virtually anything can be used as a reflector. My first photo reflector was made up of cardboard and aluminum foil. <laughs> things I had laying around the house. So if you don't want to invest the money in a real photo, real photo reflector, just get a piece of cardboard and throw some aluminum foil on it. That can actually make a big difference. You can also use white paper, anything else that's uh, white to help. And if you want to do, if you want to add some color, you have to come up with some way, maybe get some gold foil instead of just regular aluminum foil. So I definitely... You know, the yes, window yes, window, window shades from cars, they actually work really well too. Mm. So those are, those are usually pretty cheap. Unfortunately, something like this here is about 60 bucks. So unless you're serious in the photographer, photography, it might not be something you want to invest in. But reflectors make a big difference, they make a huge difference. It doesn't matter what type of camera you got, just having a reflector to control lighting makes a huge difference in the quality of your photo. So, uh, whenever I do wedding photography, I try and have somebody there assisting using the, doing the reflector for me. Just because it makes the picture so much better. Okay? 
All right, and then talk a little bit about diffusers too. The collapsible diffuser that I showed you. I've actually got some diffusers that are that are as big as my big reflector, uh, but they're definitely very handy for, for example, uh, taking off the harsh harsh shadows cast by the sun at noon, in the middle of the day. Uh, put place a diffuser above your subject, and it very much softens the lighting, and gives them a much more pleasing look. Uh, along with that, some people seem to think that bright sun is a great time to take pictures, and it's actually one of the worst. You get the hard shadows underneath people's eyes and, and noses and chins and whatnot, and it's not very pleasing. Dave? Um, unless you use it as a hair light, then it's beautiful. Yeah, if you turn the people so that their okay. back is to the sun and have the sun hitting them on top of the head and on their shoulders, that really helps to make them stand out from the background, makes them look very nice. But you definitely don't want people with this facing the sun because that doesn't look good. Side is generally not very good unless it's sunset or uh, or dawn. And uh, yeah, so diffusers are a good way to take care of the harsh shadows that are created by the sun. If you've got a small enough area that you're taking a picture of that you can actually stick a diffuser above it. and um, one thing about diffusers uh, is light is naturally diffused when bouncing off of non-mirrored surfaces. So, like somebody's shirt, if they're wearing a white shirt, that's naturally going to reflect some light up on their face and any objects that you've got around them. Uh, that light is going to be diffused. Okay. And windows, if the sun isn't coming directly from them, produces very diffused sunlight. Dave mentioned something about that a couple of times ago, where you can get a really, really nice looking photo uh, by using the light coming through a window. And you can make your own diffuser with white paper or a bed sheet, a white bed sheet if you've got one laying around. So again, don't invest all that money in a big one if you're not serious about your photography. And you can make your own. Okay? Silk cloths. Silk cloths, yeah. yeah. Yeah, silks works very well. So, um, any other questions? That's kind of everything that I had prepared, so at this point, just uh, if we got questions, we can just talk about whatever. Uh, let's see, I've got to check the email, see if there's anybody. We do have one question. Oh, okay, yeah, someone else trying to answer the quiz. <laughs> uh, See, just talking about taking pictures and portraits and stuff outside. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I know, like, ideally it's nice to have a little bit of overcast. It helps, mm -hmm. you know, blend right. the light and everything. What are some other tips, maybe a time of day that you like to shoot best? Mm -hmm. um, maybe some stylistic things that you prefer. Okay. All right, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, overcast days provide the best lighting for taking people's pictures or portraits. Uh, just because of the diffused light that it produces. Uh, I also like the light that you get right before sunset when it's coming from kind of a low angle in the sky and it's got kind of a natural orange. That natural orange gives kind of pictures a warm feeling that people tend to like and makes people look better, makes them look more tan. So they, most people tend to like that. So that's a good time. Um, you can get some good light at, at dawn, but I'm never up at dawn, so <laughs> I never get any pictures that way. Uh, but uh, probably the best tip is uh, for taking pictures outside is making sure that you've got something to control the lighting. Reflector, diffuser, uh, having people's back to the sun if you have to do it during a bright sunny time, that kind of thing. So, so like, let's say I want to take a picture like around 5 o'clock, uh -huh. like you were saying. Uh -huh. Do I want to white balance it? Or is that going to take away the whole effect of trying to get a colored light to it? Um, well, it, yeah, white balancing according to that color of light will take away some of that effect to some degree. Uh, yeah. yeah, for that reason, one of the things that I sometimes carry with me when I'm dealing with a camera that doesn't have uh, a completely manual white balance setting is a piece of paper that I've printed with a very light blue. It's, I use like some graphics program or something to produce a large blue block and then I print it out on the inkjet printer and then I white balance against that and what that does is artificially shifts the white balance towards orange 
and gives a little bit more pleasing color tone to the images. So. Sorry, yeah, you're fine. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. So, and um, Anthony had made a comment last week about raw photos. Uh -huh. um, more often these days, there are a lot of cameras that are even the point shoots that produce raw, which Correct. is the actual image off of the imager. Right. The actual data. So, more like, or less. yeah, when it comes, more or less, yeah. <laughs> um, if that's the case, a lot of these adjustments can be done after the fact, is that right? Yeah, w uh, white balance is one of the settings that you can adjust after the fact with w RAW, when you're shooting RAW, because it's not developing the image, so to speak, when you shoot in RAW. If you shoot JPEG, your, your white balance is pretty much locked down. You can't do a whole lot to change it, but if you're shooting with RAW, yeah, you can definitely adjust that afterwards. In fact, the pictures I, s I showed, the girl in the wedding dress, uh, that's how I shifted the white balance, and I actually did it afterwards. That was a raw photo, and I, sh I shifted it in Photoshop so you guys can see what happens with the different... Yeah, Kyle. You, you mentioned that you can, in broad, like broad daylight, you shoot with their back to the sun. Uh -huh. Does that put their face in shadows, or do you just need to use reflectors and a flash? And and refle stuff like reflector is uh, the best solution for that. Mm -hmm. um, flash can help some, but... I'm just not really generally a fan of direct flash. You know, if I'm using the flash, uh, I'll pop this on here. Uh, I'll put this diffuser on on the flash to try and soften it, because otherwise it's just way too harsh. Yeah. So you get something like this, you pop it on your flash, and it basically sends light everywhere, which makes it reflect off, off, off all the surfaces that are nearby and gives it a very soft, very natural look. And flashes match sunlight pretty well as far as color goes. So you won't be ruining the look of the picture by using a flash. That way. So, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alright, so again, more like kind of figure out what your style is. Uh -huh. So let's say, because you did mention wedding, let's say you're taking some wedding photos. How would you change your lighting style when going for maybe some intimate close-up photos versus maybe some group pictures? What are some things that you do that you change from one, like a close-up versus a... I mean, uh, that's, well, that's kind of a hard question. I, I know <laughs> it's very broad, but like what are some... How, how do you change the way you do lighting? Okay, well, first of all, if you're doing a big group, there typically isn't much you can do right. aside from try and move them somewhere else where they aren't looking into the sun or having the sun hit them from the side. You may not even have a choice with that, but as far as group photos, there isn't there really isn't a whole lot you can do with them. So you focus more of your artistic techniques when you're doing the individual ones. Um, you know, taking uh, close pictures uh, where you're really fo focusing on people's faces and things like that really that makes a nice looking picture. Um, one of my tricks, I hate to give this away, but one of the tricks that I like to do is I tell people to just kind of do their own thing and they'll naturally pose themselves in poses that look intimate and, and uh, look good on camera. And so I just have to be there to shoot at the right time. I typically don't have to do much as far as getting them to pose or doing any tricks with the camera in order to get uh, the best pictures. I and mean, Dave does a lot of wedding photography. Do you have any tricks that you like to use that you, that you don't mind sharing? What are you talking about getting a natural look? Getting a more intimate, natural feel for portrait. Yeah, um, definitely doing their own thing, something like that. A lot of times I'll say, I'll tell the groom to tell his bride a uh, best joke in the world, or his favorite joke, or tell, him your best, tell her your bestest joke. I'll just say it kind of goofy-like, and that way, suddenly they're, they're feeling goofy and natural, mm -hmm. and they'll just, be, they'll just knock off some neat looks. Yeah. If I said, uh, would you tell her a joke? So it's kind of the way you go about telling them, you know? You snap off your best joke real quick, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then people just, they laugh, chuckle, and they, yeah. they just are natural. The more I do this sort of thing, the more I'm realizing that getting good wedding photos and even just, pe just people pictures in general is just making sure that they're, they're comfortable and they feel uh, at home in front of the camera and so they're not really caught off guard. That's where the high-speed camera comes in. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's where having a real nice <laughs> quick shutter uh, helps. Mm -hmm. You hit the button and it takes a shot immediately. So, not so much a technical thing. It's just making sure that people are feeling comfortable. So. It's too bad you're not 
you have such a slow camera because you can do that. <laughs> well, no, it's terribly slow. <laughs> Did you show them how that fast sound goes? Yeah, uh, just demonstrating. Let's see. That's six and a half pictures a second, so. Pretty good. Yeah. It'll do that almost, almost all day long, too. You just hold it down and keep going. Oh, really? Yeah. Because they used yeah. to have on the older cans like an eight shot limit. Yeah, it's, they've taken care of that in the newer ones. Oh, wow. So, yeah. That's another advantage of having the fancy cameras. No, so, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so now's probably a good time to go ahead and sign off for the web. Uh, at this point, I'm thinking we might only have one more class, because I'm going to be doing some traveling over the next few weeks. So, next week we're going to be doing some Photoshop stuff, and if I can do it the week after that, we'll do it, but I'm not sure that we're going to be able to. Anyway, thanks for guys for watching, and if you have any other questions, be sure to email photoclass at maxoutput.com, and I'll answer them as best as I can here on camera. So, thanks for watching. We'll see you later.